Right, we're back live tonight here on In Focus. Public Service and Administration Minister Nokolo Kivet has told Parliament that the government is still battling with officials who are not qualified for positions. Trade Union Federation Kosato previously warned that uh, this misnomer will impact state capacity and affect service delivery. Now, for a broader discussion on this, we are now joined uh, by uh, Kosato Parliamentary Coordinator uh, Matthew Parks. Matthew, good to have you and thank you very much uh, for your time. Uh, and uh, for coming on in focus uh, this evening. Um, just had a conversation with the multi-party charter and uh, uh, various political parties would say, here we go again, Kosatu jumping in, meddling uh, with the labor regime in the country, causing more problems than uh, necessary. No, look, it's always good when, when uh, political parties in those seats in, in parliament know Popular support, people who have received very little mandate from the public are irritated by workers expressing their views or omit as workers who build the economies of South Africa and across the world as workers who deliver public services. And ironically, during COVID-19, when politicians are sitting at home, very safe in the lounges, drinking cheap whiskey, they were praising the very same public servants and workers like nurses and police officers and defense force personnel, municipal cleaners for keeping South Africans safe at great risk to their own lives. So it's unfortunate politicians um, from some opposition parties um, have very short and opportunistic memories. Yeah. Are, are we putting, uh, I suppose, a qualification unnecessarily as a priority more than competence and, and acumen and being able to, uh, to, to deliver on, on a particular uh, a service that you would, would have been assigned to do so. Because, I mean, for example, you hear the president now saying we must do away with experience. He has not yet said we must do away with qualification, but at least experience so that people get an opportunity to work and, and, and they're given an opportunity more than on, on the qualification, but to prove their competence in, in, in particular fields. I mean, look, it's a slightly different um, issue. So the president's talking correctly, so we think about not requiring experience at entry-level positions, either in the public sector or the private sector. To so, enable young people who naturally fresh from university or from college or from school wouldn't have experience to give them a chance to get their foot in the door, to gain the experience to enter the labor market. And that's critical for young people to be able to find permanent longer-term employment and so on. So I think that's what the president is saying. I think that's a sound argument to make. But I think with the Minister of Public Service, who was asked in Parliament, about the issue of senior management in the state not having the necessary qualification is a slightly different thing. Um, you would expect that the, uh, an executive director of a municipality in charge of, say, engineering services, distribution of water services, electricity, and so forth, would have the necessary qualifications and experience. Um, we think it would be dangerous in that instance if they didn't have it. And I think, you know, our affiliates, um, be it somewhere at a municipal level, be it in how in a departmental level or in the hospitals, etc., have raised time and again that they've often seen for themselves as nurses, as municipal officials, as teachers, as police officers, people being parachuted into very senior management positions without necessary qualifications or expertise or competence. And in fact, Nahau currently is going to court with regards to one uh, departmental director general in that regard. So I think the point is that, you know, there is in certain instances, especially at a senior management level, where the ministers are responding to, there is a need for competence, for skills and qualifications, because you wouldn't want, for example, the manager at Kubek Power Station, a nuclear power station, not to have necessary qualification and experience. I think that's what it's referring to. And I think, you know, it's quite alarming that so many public, uh, senior management officials, not public sense, senior officials, yeah. um, are found not to have it. I think in the minister's reply, it looks like it's about 10% at a management level. That's quite a high, a high amount. I think we must make it very clear because some of the media headlines at times don't make a distinction. It's referring to senior management. It's not referring to ordinary public servant, um, not referring to nurses or teachers. It's referring to political appointees at a top level. And I think one must also include many politicians have been found wanting in that regard as well. Why are we at this point when, I suppose, a call was made in 2016 already, and I suppose senior uh, government managers who might not have had a qualification by then, surely it would have been enough time now to be in a position that they have the qualification for the position that they occupy. Why have they not heeded the call? I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think maybe there's two issues at, at stake. I think one is 
that we do have some persons who choose to, to fudge a story, to misbehave, etc., to, to break the rules. And, of course, that points to a broader question across society about ethics of morality, etc. And I think we all can acknowledge that currently in South Africa, for the last decade, we are we're having an ethics problem. Um, the levels of crime and corruption across society, not only in the state, in the private sector, across society, are really are too high. So that is one issue. But I think also that we, I think unfortunately, not so long ago, we kind of undervalued education. Um, I think, you know, when Nelson Mandela and Tom Becky were president, there was a real strong emphasis on education or treating education as a lifelong journey. And I think at times we have downplayed that incorrectly. We're trying to, I think we need to rebuild that culture. Um, so one is a positive step forward in that regard is what the ANC has currently announced for its candidates for parliament. They must all have not only matric qualification, but if I'm correct, also a post-schooling, a tertiary qualification as well. I think that's the correct approach to take because you need to be seen to be championing education to treat it not just as an obligation you had as a child going to school or university or college, as a lifelong journey. Um, it's going to benefit the individuals in terms of their own career um, development, but it benefits society as well. And ironically, as a country, we're not short of, re- short of resources in that regard. The amount of money we collect for the National Skills Fund, for the CETAs, it's a huge amount, and often it's is spent on not really useful courses when it should actually be spent on investing in workers, investing in officials, senior management to get qualifications to improve their own career opportunities and to benefit their own workplaces too. Yeah. So the the, the, the last time this, uh, of course, was ventilated in Parliament, it reflected that a huge number of these senior members would exist, for example, within East African Police Service, where the qualifications reflected on their personal uh, uh, detail uh, it, it doesn't match up one would then think it would be as easy because you've got that in the system, it's reflected in the system as maybe hitting them where it matters most, most in the pockets uh, so if you quickly adjust their, their, their income uh, they, they would want to get the qualification yeah. I, mean, I think we would want to take a, <laughs> maybe a, a more humane approach and that's a good, good word to use um, look, I mean, they should be required to do so. It is found that according to their position in the police service at a senior management level, they need this qualification. We think that it would be correct to, to give them a reasonable time frame. This often does happen across the public service to say you've got five years to meet this um, to earn this qualification. And then the workplace should be also you know, put in place necessary support measures too because you may find it might be quite difficult in some positions to work what often is an overtime job with a huge amount of responsibilities and hours put in um, and then just study at the same time. So workplaces should also put in place measures to assist those persons to study, including the issue of um, bursaries where the person maybe couldn't afford it, etc. And of course, the amount of time and hours that's required as well. Um, but yeah, we would want to avoid kind of the going the salary deduction route. I think it's never uh, a positive route to go. Um, Rather go the supportive route, give them five years, give them the necessary assistance, etc. And it should be done. It should be made a requirement. Um, we really need to make a culture of emphasizing that education has to be a lifelong journey and there can never be too much education. But if that, I suppose, is then attached to an incapable state, um, a, a, a state that is unable to give services to the, to, to, to the people, is five years not a long time for us to wait? Yeah, I think part of the problem here also is that it's not just a question of um, a person didn't have a you know bachelor's of public administration or whatever. You know, some positions require certain you know, very specialized um, qualifications, like to be a, d- a director of utility service in a municipality. You need to have a degree of an engineering. You need to be registered with the engineering council, etc. Have experience. So in that instance, if you don't have it. Um, it must be very difficult to make up that qualification in a few years because you never had it in the first place and you need to have some experience in that sector to, to achieve that. So I think that one is a slightly different ball game, and that one is quite worrying in that regard. So uh, how, how, how do we then meet, as opposed to, uh, as I say, how do we chew and, and, and walk at the same time? Where we are, uh, of course, meeting the, 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 the qualifications um, uh, requirements, plus also minimizing the impact on service delivery everywhere. Yeah. Look, I mean, in the majority of the instances where it's a simple issue of upgrading your qualifications, 
then they sure the, the the common sense approach which many departments do already do um, and have been doing is to give support to this person to get the qualifications, um, give them a reasonable time frame, you know, require them to do so, etc. In most instances, um, those officials will do so. But you know, where there were some instances where persons were blatantly appointed in spite of not having the qualifications because they had a political friendship um, or people, you know, um, engaged in fraud or forgery, etc. That's a different kettle of fish, and there'll have to be a different approach and different consequences in that instance, because that would have serious issues. And that's why, for example, some of our unions have gone to court at times, because some positions are very sensitive in the state. Um, they require specialized qualifications, and one wouldn't simply be able to go study engineering on the side. That's that's a very difficult and complicated degree. It's full-time studies, and also something you can do through correspondence or part-time studies. So how, how do you... Uh have that conversation with uh, your own affiliates because one of the conversations we had about the professionalization of the public sector uh, w w was that uh, uh, in, in fact the, 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 the question of holding a political uh, position and, 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 and being a public servant was, was being debated and uh, Nahau was saying well, the, the, that thing should not even begin to, to come into question because um, people should be allowed to be political if they want to. But that's precisely the problem. The, these positions become politicized, and, and, and then you, you are, you're having a difficulty to professionalize them. Yeah. So, look, I think one thing is that whatever we do, whatever laws and policy we have, we must always be grounded in the Constitution. And the Constitution guarantees all South Africans, without exception, the right of political association, freedom of belief. Um, it doesn't qualify it. So if we're going to do as had been intended with the municipal workers to ban all municipal employees, all 350,000 of them, from holding office in a political party, if we would extend that to all 1.2 million public servants, that's a very slippery slope. Because where will you stop? Will you next go to ESCOM workers? Will you next go to transit workers? You might even end up going to General Zadnizum Africa. And that's going to be a slippery slope because who to say who should not have the right to be a member of a political party, to hold office in a party, to have views, etc., and who shouldn't be? Where would you stop? Uh, there have been some countries in the world where, for example, police officers and defense force personnel cannot even vote in an election. So we shouldn't be interfering with people's constitutional rights. Um, we've had good engagement with government around both issues, and we've managed to find conclusion on the, for example, public servants, that the limitation of holding office in a political party would only apply to the heads of department. That's directors general, um, or, the, you know, for example, the commission of police, the SARS commission, the chief of the defense force, etc., and those senior managers report directly to them. And that, we think, is a fair compromise, because I think most people wouldn't want, for example, a commissioner of the police to be holding office in a political party, per se, or a commissioner of the revenue service, or the head of intelligence service, etc. And I think that's a fair compromise. Um, with regards to local government, we had to go to the constitutional court. Um, the court, or sorry, the labor court, rather, found in our favor that it is unconstitutional to ban 350,000 municipal workers from holding office in a party. And they've narrowed that limitation of rights senior simply to municipal managers and to the executive management team reporting to them. And that, we think, is a fair compromise. Um, we don't mind a, a small surgical limitation of a few people's rights um, to kind of, you know, depoliticize, or, for lack of a better word, professionalize uh, public service or local government. But we should not be interfering with the rights of workers. Uh, workers are like any other South African. They've got the rights. Um, and look, if, for example, a you know, municipal employee or public servant, you know, misbehaves in terms of the code of conduct of their workplace, management is paid to manage those kind of issues. There are disciplinary codes of conduct, there are ways to deal with the transgression of the workplace. Management should be able to deal with that issue. If management can't deal with those simple kind of transgressions, then why are they receiving managerial salaries? But we shouldn't take a few instances of wrong behavior and then decide to ban the political rights of one and a half million people. That would be a very slippery slope. And given our history of only recently becoming a democracy three decades ago, we wouldn't want to be interfering or tinkering with the Constitution on such a fundamental right of workers. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much uh, for coming on. Matthew Parks there, uh, and uh, he's representing Kosatu.